Good evening, I'm Jim Kircher, and this is our 22 Voter's Guide special. We started doing these a few elections ago with reporters from St. Louis Public Radio because while a lot of voters know who they're going to vote for in those big races this year, that would be Missouri Senator, Senator and Governor in Illinois, congressional races, maybe state offices, we're often less prepared for what we might find further down the ballot, those amendments and other questions in races. Well, we're not going to try to convince you one way or the other how to vote, but we are going to explain and discuss sort of give you a heads up before you cast your ballot. So stay with us. Much of the attention on election night in Missouri will be the race to replace retiring Republican Senator Roy Blunt. In Illinois, the incumbent governor and a senator are running for re-election, and we'll talk about those and other races and issues on the ballots including Missouri's legalizing marijuana amendment. But we're going to start with the Missouri Senate race. It's a face-off between Republican Attorney General Eric Schmidt and political newcomer Democrat Trudy Bush Valentine, part of the Anheuser-Busch family. It's very possible you've seen a commercial or two regarding this race. But Missouri is no longer the battleground state it once was. And St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum takes a look at what it will take to win or lose in the Senate race in Missouri. Back when Missouri was an evenly divided state, Democrats won elections by piecing together a broad geographic coalition. But things began to collapse in the 2010s when Missouri Democrats lost legislative seats in rural areas that tilted toward the party for generations. That was a precursor to the 2016, 2018, and 2020 election cycles, years in which Republicans won basically every major statewide contest. If Democrat Trudy Bush Valentine is going to pull off the upset against Republican Attorney General Eric Schmidt, she'll have to recreate the coalition in three steps. First, Bush Valentine will need to run up the score in places like St. Louis, St. Louis County, and Kansas City. She'll also need strong turnout from Columbia, which is still fairly Democratic, but more hospitable to Republicans in recent years. This is probably the easiest step, especially since St. Louis County is quickly becoming a major Democratic stronghold. But it's not enough for Bush Valentine to get a large percentage of the vote. She also needs to turn a lot of people in these Democratic jurisdictions out to the polls. Second, Bush Valentine either has to come close to winning or win fast-growing suburbs with lots of conservative-minded voters. This includes places like Jefferson and Lincoln counties, which have taken a hard right turn over the past few election cycles. It also means prevailing in parts of the state that encompass the Kansas City metro area, like Clay, Platt, and Buchanan counties. And she has to hold down GOP margins in St. Charles and Greene counties. Gaining ground in those places has been a long-term desire among Democrats, but a desire that's not had much success. Finally, Bush Valentine will need to hold down Schmidt's margins in rural counties. And this could be the most difficult task, since voters in places like Northeast and Southeast Missouri soundly rejected Democratic candidates in recent years. What makes this challenge even more daunting is that Bush Valentine could do everything right, like run compelling TV ads, get lots of volunteers, attack Schmidt on the right issues. But if President Joe Biden's approval rating is lagging among Missouri voters, she may lose anyway, especially if things like inflation continue to be top of mind. Bush Valentine, though, is monitoring whether a backlash to the demise of Roe vs. Wade energizes enough people to vote for Democrats, especially in some of the more populated suburbs. Still, if the blowback isn't enough to resurrect the urban-suburban-rural coalition, then it's almost a certainty Schmidt will be headed to Washington as Missouri's next U.S. Senator. And joining me now are political reporters Jason Rosenbaum and Rachel Lippman from St. Louis Public Radio. Thanks for joining us, you guys. A uh, lot to talk about. But Jason, just to continue on this Senate race, does this come down to anything more than abortion, inflation, Biden agenda, Trump agenda? Or are there some real issues in here that people are going to be looking at? No, I think you have the right idea. A lot of times when we're talking about U.S. Senate races in Missouri, it's the national environment that is prevalent. And right now, as we're, we're taping this, Republicans seem to be on track to have a better than usual election cycle, which is not surprising. Typically, 
the, the opposite party of the president does well after the first two years. But it's compounded by the fact that Missouri has become a much more Republican state since I started covering politics in 2006. So if you have a candidate like Republican Attorney General Eric Schmidt, who is really talking about how bad Joe Biden is, and that's resonating with people in Missouri that don't like him, I mean, it's as simple as that for him to win. Yeah, are we playing much of a role? Missouri hasn't been getting a lot of attention, I think, because of this race. Not probably going to play much of a role, you think, in the majorities in, in D.C., in the House and the Senate. Missouri is not a nationally targeted Senate race. And while that may seem like inside baseball, that often is the difference between a candidate like Trudy Bush Valentine winning or losing. Now, she has self-funded her campaign and has been able to put a lot of ads on TV, really hammering Schmidt on the abortion issue since he actually signed the paperwork to ban most abortions in the state after Roe versus Wade was overturned. But again, since national Democratic and Republican resources are not coming into the state, it's not seen as competitive. And since it's a Republican-leaning state. Schmidt seems to be favored at this moment. I think you're looking at a chicken or egg question there. The money isn't coming in because they don't think the race is competitive. Do they think it would have been different with a different candidate? I don't know, but she was unlikely to get resources because there are so many other races that Democrats either need to target or protect. Yeah, so let's, Rachel, let's talk about something else that's going on this year in Missouri, the voter ID law requiring a uh, photo ID. Um, is this significant, do you think, in terms of who's going to vote or not vote? I don't think you're going to see an impact in turnout in general. It's not going to drive down turnout in any sort of drastic way, shape, or form. There's been enough publicity about requiring this government-issued photo ID so you can't use a... St uh, a uh, college ID or a work ID, for example, to prove your identity. And you aren't blocked from casting a ballot if you don't have that. You can cast what's known as a provisional ballot. They will validate your ID later. Could it matter if it comes down to provisional ballots could tip an election one way or the other? Yes, that is always a possibility. But in terms of suppressing voter turnout in large ways, I don't think that's going to be a factor now. So people should be prepared, though, to, to have that if they don't. Correct. If you have a voter, or a state a government issued photo ID, bring that to cast a regular ballot. But you will be allowed to cast a provisional ballot if for whatever reason you don't have a, photo, a government ID. OK, the other uh, statewide. Uh, office is Missouri Auditor Nicole Galloway, the Democrat, the only woman in Democrat, I believe, right? Yes. In state office, uh, is not running for re-election. Um, and we have uh, Democrat Alan Green, Republican Scott Fitzpatrick. Significant differences, or is this still just a Republican-Democrat race? The main significant difference is Fitzpatrick is already a statewide official and has lots of money at his disposal. And Green, who's a former state representative, actually came on our podcast, Politically Speaking, and talked about how Democrats that donated to Galloway were not receptive to donating to him. And the fundraising gap between the two is astonishing, given that this is Democrats trying to preserve their only statewide office. And pretty much everybody I talk to believe that Fitzpatrick is going to win this and win this big because of that fundraising disparity. I think one of the most interesting races uh, in St. Louis County is County Executive Sam Page, Mark Montavani. Rachel, what are we looking at here? <laughs> this is going to be, I think, one of the closer races you are going to see in this election cycle. Uh, Sam Page was looking at a glide path to re-election. Catherine Pinner was the original nominee to be the Republican candidate. And a total uh, surprise from correct. the Correct. Fringe right. candidate would be a, a, a charitable way to describe her. And she stepped aside. Some contend that she was pushed out because the party apparatus realized they had no chance if she remained the candidate. And she was replaced, as you mentioned, by Mark Montavani. His name may sound familiar to watchers of county politics. He's run for the county executive office as a Democrat twice. He is running a campaign that reminds me a lot of the primary election between Sam Page and Jane Duker. He is hitting Dr. Page on his uh, competence at just running the apparatus and the machinery of government and his relationships with and uh, people within the county government orbit, specifically the county council. 
He appears to be trying to get moderate Republicans to pair with more moderate Democrats or those who just simply do not like Page to try and find a way to victory. Uh, with a lot of divisions within the county There government. are plenty of divisions yeah. within county politics. I'm not quite course. sure even the Democrats and Republicans are where you expect them to and be. And there is, of course, a question as to whether party divisions or party labels matter in a, a county just, you know, trying to make the trains run on time uh, position as county executive. And uh, Mr. Montevani has said himself, he's not even sure the labels are needed, but he did see an opportunity to come and, as he put it, try to make county function a little bit better. He's touting his business credentials as someone who, you know, knows how apparatuses, big companies, because county government is in a way a big company to work. Let's look at the uh, St. Louis Board of Aldermen presidency. Um, John Coder, Megan Jack Coder, Green, yep. Jack. And, um, His official name is John, but he uh, most people know him as Jack. <laughs> okay, well maybe I went by the ballot. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, take a, a quick uh, assessment of that race. And again, this is kind of special because things are going to change again pretty quickly. This is filling in uh, the, from the resignation. Yes, this is a seat that whoever wins will hold for about five months from the time they are sworn in until the uh, election in April, the regular city election in April. And the biggest thing that they gain out of this is the power of incumbency going into April. The biggest challenge that they have is getting the Board of Aldermen ready to operate as a 14 member yeah. board. That's the, the, the thing that I think is the elephant in the room is these are two white candidates in a city that is basically even evenly divided between yeah, black and white. It's unusual for any city election. And my biggest question is when there's another race for Board of Aldermen president in March, does somebody like a state senator, Carla May, run for this and then blow whoever wins out in North St. Louis and then, depending on who wins, does well in Southwest St. Louis? It's very possible that the person that wins this race could only be in office for three or four months, depending on that dynamic. So let's talk uh, quickly then about Missouri 2nd Congressional District, uh, Ann Wagner, Democrat, Trish Gumby. I think the 1st Congressional District, we don't need to talk much about. Uh, Cory Bush is going to win. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about 2nd uh, Congressional District. Um, is it a lock for Republicans, or is this is this one of those competitive areas? I think that the Republican, in this case, Ann Wagner, is favored this cycle, especially if it's a Republican wave election. This is a newly formulated second district that includes Franklin County, Western St. Charles County, and Democrats are going to need to do some long-term party building in those areas if they want to make the 2nd Congressional District competitive long-term. I could see that happening later in the decade because it does include some very Democratic areas, particularly my house in Richmond <laughs> Heights, which is probably an 80% Democratic area. But it's going to take some time for that to actually occur. Trish Gunby is a really good candidate. She's a state rep, and she won a Republican seat uh, I believe in 2019 in a special election. Right. Okay, so we'll um, so she she may run this time. She may fall short. Maybe she runs in 2024, and she's done enough party building that I talked about. But it's going to be an uphill battle battle for her because Ann Wagner's a, a good candidate. Yeah. I will be very curious to see if this does prompt the Democratic Party to start doing the party building efforts in the areas of the state that they need to do it. They can no longer rely on St. Louis, St. Louis County, Columbia, and Kansas City to carry themselves in the state. They are going to have to make outreach into St. Charles, Franklin, Warren, et cetera. And will they realize that with the second congressional district and act on it? Great. Well, we've got some yes, no issues, as you know, on the ballot. Uh, we're gonna run through those and then we're going to talk about it. State investments, allowing the legislature to override current restrictions and expanding the state treasurer's investment options. Amendment 3, this is the one that would legalize marijuana for personal, not just medical use. There are other provisions here which we're going to get into. Amendment 4 has to do with the Kansas City Police Department raising minimum funding. KCPD is still under control of a state board, and in Kansas City, this is often seen as a battle between state and local control. Amendment 5 has to do with the Missouri National Guard. It would move control of the Guard from the Department of Public Safety to its own department under the governor. And there's this question. Should Missouri call a state constitutional convention? 
This is not coming from a particular campaign or interest group. It's a question that has to go on the ballot every 20 years, and it's that time again. So I'm thinking it's this marijuana legalization, which I think from a simple question, yes or no, a lot of people will have an opinion. Kind of seems like the devil's in the details uh, on this one. Always is. Very much so. Uh, Missouri legalized marijuana for medicinal use in 2018. And this essentially allows adults to go into a marijuana dispensary and buy a certain amount of cannabis. And for a lot of St. Louis residents in particular, like if they want cannabis, they go to Illinois already. And I think that the mindset uh, among a lot of people is like, well, if they're going to be doing that, Missouri might as well make some money off of it and prevent people from being, you know, criminalized because of it. But the devil really is in the details. There has been a lot of criticism of this particular amendment because it gives people who have medical marijuana licenses the ability to just sell it for adult use. Yeah, the sense is some people are being prevented from getting into the bus this Made business. Made it more difficult to get into the business, absolutely. And in addition to the fact that there are some people who are like, well, that's just going to enrich in existing license holders. It's, it's part of this broader philosophical debate about whether Missouri should have a very restricted system of licenses where only a certain amount of entities get it, or it should be a lot looser like in several other states. Um, I think that there's a lot on the line here. There is a feeling that if this does not pass, there's really not a pathway in the Missouri legislature to legalize marijuana for adult use. And, if that occurs, we may have to wait for the feds to do something across the entire country. The tricky situation you have, as you do with any initiative petition, is because the devil is in the details, they're not going to get everything right the first time. There are going to be fixes and tweaks that need to be made. That is true with any major program. But because Amendment 3 is an initiative petition, got on the ballot because of signatures, that is how any fix needs to be made. They can't go to the legislature and said, oops, we screwed up, we moved a comma over here, that means something different, we put you know, the wrong tax amount in there. It would also, that, any fixes would have to go back to the voters. So they perhaps have set themselves up through unforeseen consequences to create a system that may not sustain itself. And then you also spoil your chances because what you have created becomes such a mess. Yeah, so this is something I think that is worth reading all of those, those, those issues uh, besides simply deciding on the yes or no part of this. So I want to move on to something else. A recently released Harvard put, uh, um, poll revealed that nearly two-thirds of young Americans are fearful about the future of this country's democracy. So with the help of the Ethics Project, 9PBS's Anne Marie Berger sat down with some young uh, a diverse group of young, future, and current voters to get their perspectives on this. Is being able to vote something that is important to you? Where is it on your radar? I think it's really important because we want certain things and we want different changes and stuff in the world and for our environment, ourselves. So, you know, it really matters uh, for our future and success. My mom always said that if you don't vote, don't complain about politics because well. like your, <laughs> um, your, vo your vote is like your voice in society. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like really important that once you reach that age mark to like go and put yourself out there and like show just how and who you want to represent yourself yeah. with. We all know like voting is important. It's so easy to say, uh, voting is the cornerstone of democracy, voting is my voice, but yet consistently America has um, a pretty low uh, turnout of eligible voters. It's like consistently like around the 50% mark. And I think it's really important to uh, try and examine like we all know it's important, but why are so many of us like indifferent to it when it comes to like actually doing it? Do you think it has to do with transportation? people feeling that their vote voice doesn't matter. What are some of those reasons? Voter suppression is like one major factor in that, along with transportation and so many other things. And like Missouri right now, it's like the hardest to register to vote and to just vote in general. At the end of August, the new voting laws um, came into play and you have to have a driver's license to, to vote. I don't think that there should be any 
barriers um, that would prevent people from voting. I think that it's a right that we all have, and I think that when the government starts requiring people to show their driver's license or um, or their, I mean, their passport or birth certificate, I think that that can present a major barrier to. Uh, certain people. How would you address being able to identify people? Are there any solutions for that so there aren't, you know, voter fraud or anything like that? We definitely have the technology to keep track of yeah. Yeah. everybody. Yeah. So um, I think if we just go about and modernize our systems, I think we totally could put in the infrastructure to keep everyone identified and have that system be secure. Because it is clear that um, our elections are very impactful on our foreign policy and thus how other countries interact with us. So it makes sense that other countries would want to interact, try as much as they can to influence our elections as well. Um, so it makes sense to have some sort of identification to make sure that votes are valid. Um, but I think, we, I think we definitely need to modernize it. If you're going to require me to do something, I would like you to make it possible for me to do that. Uh, recently I got my passport renewed and it was over a hundred dollars. I don't know how much it costs to get a new driver's license or a state ID. Uh, when you're too busy thinking about your day-to-day -day, uh, struggles, voting is not at the top of your list. Getting a new ID to vote is not at the top of your list. Rent, food, that sort of thing is what's occupying your mind, even though again we all know how important voting is. What are you going to look for in politicians? What matters to you? What are those issues? So for me personally, the most important thing is of morally good character. I'm just, that's, to me it's as simple as that. So morality as a base layer is, 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 is big. Like as I am looking forward to voting, I, I would say that one of my priorities is making sure that there is um, a representative government and people serving in positions that look like America. A lot of the people look exactly the same. Yeah. They're all like older people, white men for the yeah. most part. So like, I totally agree morality is my number one, but I also want to see somebody who at least looks like me. A woman, biracial, something like that, so they can represent the minority that I also represent. At least when I was in AP US History, my teacher told me how um, the Democratic and Republican parties used to be more overlapped and closely related mm -hmm. and how we're more polarized than ever at this point. In order for us to actually like change our democracy, we need people in politics who are morally good, which is so upsetting to say that it's become so rare right now for people to actually want the best for this country. So we still have the Illinois races to cover, and for that we uh, turn to Hannah Meisel. She's the politics and government editor for NPR Illinois, and she joined us from her office in Springfield. Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the the top races, what I would consider the top races. You've got uh, J.B. Pritzker uh, running against a downstater, Darren Bailey. It seems to me that um, Darren Bailey has the uphill battle here. What would he need to do? To, uh, to make inroads and, and win this election against Prisker? Well, in Illinois, two thirds of voters live in the Chicago area or what we call the collar counties around the city of Chicago, Cook County. Um, and those suburban voters, just like everywhere else in the country have become, you know, that's the battleground now. And so I will be interested though, in the votes that, uh, uh, Darren Bailey gets in some of those suburbs, particularly where um, we have seen this kind of parental rights movement take hold. Uh, you know, this parental rights movement that began kind of about masks um, in schools and then has uh, evolved into being about, um, you know, teaching so-called CRT or um, promoting LGBT uh, inclusion in schools, which um, conservatives have labeled indoctrination of all kinds. Um, and so, of course, Darren Bailey represents those people. Illinois Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth is running for a second term, facing off against a Republican, Kathy Salvi, who, like other Republicans, is focusing on crime, inflation, drugs, education, and the so-called Biden agenda. She lags behind Duckworth in fundraising and name recognition, 
But how much are these issues going to resonate now and in the future? You know, is this going to take hold in Illinois, particularly in the suburbs? And then what does that mean for the next election cycle? The Democrats redrew congressional districts for this election and created a new 13th district. It stretches from Metro East through Springfield, Decatur, to Champaign-Urbana, with Democrat Nikki Budzinski and Republican Regan Deering in the running. Well, certainly uh, Nikki Budzinski, who is the Democrat here, that district was definitely drawn with her in mind. She was the person uh, who you know, had been interested in that seat for, you know, the longest time. She has uh, ties to the Pritzker administration, having worked in there. She's been a long time, uh, you know, union organizer, labor organizer. She also most recently, before returning to Illinois to run this campaign, she had worked in the Biden administration. But uh, Regan Deering, you know, she is a lifelong uh, resident of Decatur. She, her family is very important. Her grandfather, you know, founder of ADM. Uh, and, you know, she's using uh, everything that she has in her arsenal. This is a district that, of course, was drawn with the Demo- Democrat in mind. But um, it's, you know, it's definitely not a lock for Democrats. Illinois also has on the ballot Constitutional Amendment 1 the so-called Workers' Rights Amendment, which would strengthen collective bargaining rights. Illinois is already a strong union state, but if this passes, Meisel says however it's implemented will likely be challenged. It's really going to be up to the courts to determine what that means and interpret it. And so that's why I say we don't know what it'll happen. And that's, you know, been kind of conservatives' main argument not to vote for it, but again, an argument that has not been very well funded. Hannah, on election night in Illinois, anything particularly that you're going to be looking at? I'm going to be very interested in voter turnout. Um, As you know, during midterm election years, voter turnout is certainly down from presidential election years. But I'm really interested in the level of voter engagement. We will see. You know, voter turnout really says a lot about what kinds of political strategies work, what kinds of, um, you know, political strategies will be pulled from in the future, and what kind of country we will be, you know, going forward. Great. So, Jason, Rich, I'm going to ask you guys the same question I asked Hannah. Uh, Jason, election night, besides the races, anything you're going to be looking at? Any, any red flags, green flags, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to be looking to see if Trudy Bush Valentine gets in the teens in some rural counties. There's been some suggestion that Missouri Democrats have hit bottom in rural Missouri, and I actually think that it's possible they could do worse than McCaskill or Nicole Galloway did. And Missouri Democrats will not win statewide elections if they completely write off the rural parts of the state. It's just not possible mathematically. Rachel, how about you? I am going to be looking to see on election day whether the election denier movement uh, has any impact at polling places, is out attempting to intimidate voters in areas. Obviously, with Missouri not being particularly competitive for either party, I don't know if that is going to be as much of a thing as it will be, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not some of that movement still bubbles up and there are attempts to influence one way or the other, and whether any candidates afterwards begin to cry, oh, foul, I don't accept the results. Great, thank you. Interesting year as always, every year, but, but, but this year particularly. So I want to thank you guys, Jason Rosenbaum, Rachel Lipman, Hannah Meisel for joining us, and I want to thank you for joining us as well. I'm Jim Kircher. Thank you. <laughs>